Okay, let me get this. I specifically um, pulled up the most current statistics, focus on um, the state of Pennsylvania. Many of you know that when on May 11th, when COVID-19 was no longer uh, declared a public health emergency, one of the cutbacks um, that came along with that was the tracking of COVID-19 globally, as well as within the United States. Um, the abundance of information and the day-to-day -day tracking has really been uh, pushed back. Um, but what has continued to happen is that, um, you know, uh, health departments and the CDC are still doing some tracking. And one of the things they're tracking, um, this is what I have up on the screen. This is a, a, a screenshot of the emergency department visits uh, for COVID-19 within the past uh, months within the state of Pennsylvania. And what you can see is, you know, we were all the way down here and many of you know, somewhere in the summer months towards um, the mid to end of July, we started hearing news reports about an uptick in COVID-19 cases. Um, this particular um, slide that I have was the most updated I could get for the state of Pennsylvania. And it cuts off somewhere around the first week of September. But if I was to continue it out to today, you would see that we are still on the rise. I'm trying to get this out my way. Um, let me just go back. That kind of came on the scene. Um, let me see if I could get this to go back. Okay. So, um, so this now is another slide that's looking at COVID-19 hospitalizations. Um, and this is something that is reported week by week. So as you can uh, see off to the corner here, this was a much more updated slide. Um, and as you can see, the rate of hospitalizations, um, this was the first week of August, second week of August, third end of August, going into the first week of September. And as you can see in the month of September and um, we are above already above really closer to 600 in the state of Pennsylvania, once again, um, 600 um, hospital admissions. That means they've gone through the ER and their COVID-19 infection was uh, severe enough that they had to be admitted, okay? So we're looking at, as you can see, if you look at the trend, an upward tick since the beginning of August, end of July. Um, this one is what they call provisional COVID-19 deaths. And um, we're just looking at it. And, and I wanted to show this slide because even though the infection rate, the emergency room visits, the hospitalization rates are on the uptick, knowing that death is a lagging statistics, but, um, you know, and, and look at the numbers. So this is from five to 30. So the good news is that even though there's an uptick in infections, hospitalizations, ER visit, um, it's not that severe that we are experiencing a significant uptick in COVID-19 deaths. Granted that one life loss is valuable to that person's loved ones, right? But this is what we look at. The reason we say it's provisional is because whenever you're tracking death rates, they lag behind the other um, the other statistics because you know sometimes. Um, the data is not um, uploaded, especially now that everything has been rolled back as far as tracking. 
Um, but the good news is, is that um, the variants and out there, the death rate is still remaining low. This is something I wanted to introduce. Um, this is what's called wastewater surveillance. And this is for the state of Pennsylvania. And I'm gonna explain this. A lot of times what this is based on is that those who are infected with the, uh, the SARS coronavirus that causes COVID-19, they actually shed that virus in their feces. And what surveil what they do is what the health department and other municipal water agencies do is sometimes the first indication they get that a particular community's COVID-19 infection rate is increasing is by testing the wastewater for the virus that has been shed, right? So when you look at the, so um, a red dot means there's, they see a significant large increase and this orange dot means means, oh, I want to, uh, this thing is so sensitive, that they see an increase. So if you look at the Philadelphia area, Trenton area, it goes out to Pittsburgh, um, it's at an increase. And, and that's consistent with what we're saying. COVID-19 infections are at an increase, nowhere near pandemic levels, but we see that expected fall increase. Um, but sometimes this water surveillance is the first indication that something is going on in a particular community. And they check for a lot of viruses in wastewater, but I just wanted to, um, to let you know about this surveillance. And this surveillance, this way, wastewater surveillance has been ongoing even in the context of it no longer being considered a public health emergency. So what are the variants we're dealing with? Um, you know, all of these variants are some subvariant of Omicron, right? Um, which seems to now have presented itself as the dominant strain and then all these substrains. Now, um, Currently, and this particular data is as of September 16th, the, there is a variant you may have heard in the news called Eris, which it's, it's EG.5. And right now, Eris is accounting for over 25% 25, 25 of the current COVID infections, right? The other one that's on the scene is Fornax. And Fornax, as of September 16th, is accounting for about 14% of infections. We still have um, the XBB variants, which were very prominent in the beginning of the year, um, even as early as the fall winter season of last year. Um, the two variants, 1.16 and 1.16.6, are accounting for about 20% of cases. Now the newest one on the scene, and right now it has um, it has been detected in 10 out of the 50 states, um, and New York and Pennsylvania are two of the states where Parola, um, which is, a, now all these are just variants. What well, all this is telling you is that this particular virus, loves to mutate itself, right? Uh, and it and and corona was always known as a cold virus, right? The coronas that we know. And what do we know about the cold? There is no cure for the common cold because it is one of those viruses that mutates itself. The same thing with the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. It mutates. It changes. And really what it's trying to do is that this virus needs the human body to live, right? It needs the human body to survive. So it's gonna do all that it can to stay in that body to reproduce itself. And it is in that reproductive state that we get the symptoms. So what other viruses like this? The flu virus, the cold virus. And, um, and it's a reason why 
and, and I'm getting into this, why we need to stay up to date and why vaccines and boosters and all of that is on the scene, because we're just, we really are in a catch up. Right. By the time this virus has mutated itself and one of the new variants is on the scene, once once your immune system, whether it's through a vaccine or through having gotten the natural COVID-19 disease, once your body mounts a defense against it and puts up a protective antibody, this virus goes, wait a minute, I got to get around that. And the next thing you know is that it's found a way to change whatever it needed to change to be able to attach itself and create an infection. So it's ever-changing variants and variants, is, that's what they are. It's like looking at a tree with all its branches, right? So for the Eris and for Fornax and Parola now is on the scene, they tend to cause more what we consider upper respiratory symptoms, right? Um, the runny nose, the sore throat, the nasal congestion. Um, you know, um, people are showing more with when infected with Fornax, they tend to show more cough um, symptoms with or without mucus production and more people um, present with headaches with this particular variant. But I just wanted to let you know that um, the, the, the symptoms of a COVID-19 infection is what the original you know, novel virus does. You know, you can have chills, you can have fever, you can have fatigue, you can have shortness of breath, body muscle ache, headache, nausea, diarrhea, loss of taste and smell. You usually get those GI symptoms, the nausea, the diarrhea, and the vomiting as the virus is shedding and traveling through the body to be excreted out. Sometimes it'll hit the gut and cause those gut-like symptoms, okay? You can shed this virus for up to 90 days. So some of you may take a rapid antigen test now, those at-home tests, and it shows that you're positive for COVID-19. Um, you can test yourself in, in five days. You may still be positive. You might test yourself within seven, 10 days and the rapid antigen turns negative. But if you was to look at a PCR test, people's PCR tests can be positive up to 90 days. It, we're still running about 90 days for the body to shed this virus. Granted that if you have underlying conditions, metabolic reason, it can happen a little sooner or it can be longer than 90 days, right? But what we are concerned about is that infectious period. You know, you're not going to isolate yourself for 90 days waiting for your uh, PCR test to turn negative. And I'll get to that in a little while. So once again, I just want to remind you that if you do test positive for COVID-19 um, and you are and you have what we call mild COVID infection, you know, it's not really impacting your day to day. You have to isolate for five days after your symptoms begin right? So you have to isolate. That means you should not be around other people. And if you live with other people, you, they and you should be wearing masks in the household. If you have the ability to sleep separately from those individuals, do that. Or if you can't and you share a bed, you're at the head and your bedmate is at the bottom, their head, you know? Um, so you, um, so, and the way you consider the five days is the day that your symptoms begin is day zero. And then you count five days out, okay? So some people say, oh, I started coughing. I tested positive. Day one is the day I started coughing. No, that's day zero. That's your first day of your symptoms. You count five days, right? Sometimes... After the five days, if you are, if you believe, if you're still fatigued, if you're still coughing, you can extend that 
to 10 days, right? You can extend that to 10 days. Um, it is recommended that the first time you retest yourself is that five day period. Um, you could test yourself in the five day with an at-home test to see if you are negative, if the antigen is negative. Um, and then again, I would test myself on the 10th day. Now, if you have moderate um, COVID-19 infections, um, and like I said, if after those five days, you're still coughing, you're still tired, you're still sneezing, whatever, you can extend that isolation to a full 10 days. And I know a lot of employers um, and you could check your company's policy, but they have what's called COVID leave, some companies, and they can extend that leave out to 10 days where it's not tapping in to your normal PTO or sick time, right? So check with your human resources and see what, what, how they handle and manage the days that you may have to take off of work, right? Um, those five days should not come out of your banked time, but definitely check with your um, human resource department. Those with severe infections, they may need to extend their isolation period. And if you're if you're really at severe in infection, uh, moderate, really moderate to severe, um, you may already have gone to an ER, you may have already been hospitalized. It doesn't necessarily mean you land in the ICU, but your time period is going to be beyond those 10 days. Um, the same medications are available. If you have symptoms and you feel that you're moving out of that mild range and there's, and it's starting to impact your breathing or your activities of daily living, you can reach out to your uh, provider and get um, treatment with Paxlovid or even one of the monoclonal antibodies. That's a discussion with which one would benefit you with your provider. But remember, anytime you want to go for treatment, the earlier you do it in your infection state, the better, right? So many of you know that CDC and um, FDA just approve. Um, and they're not really, this is not a booster. Okay. This is a COVID, a, a new COVID vaccine. Okay. And it's available now. Um, it's, it's by Pfizer. It's called BioNTech. I'll show you what the box look like on one. Yeah. This is, this is the new packaging. Oh, geez. Computer is so sensitive. This is one of the new packaging. This is what it looks like. Um, so why? Why do we need this? Everybody's like, here we go again. But I remember those of you that I've had this discussion with, and I said, you know, uh, the COVID-19 um, disease is following flu. And eventually, and we, we, we're kind of getting there already, but nobody wants to say it, it's going to it's going to be an annual shot, right? But what they're doing with COVID nineteen that's a little different is as these variants, these strains pop up, and they start to see that it's impacting, um, you know, um, that there's an uptick in cases, and and what really they look at is hospitalizations, right? Um, and they look to see what's the strain out there that's causing the the most infection that's leading people to the ER and to be hospitalized. And then they come and say, well, you know what? Let's make um let's make a vaccine against that strain, right? So this is this is what I'm telling you. All of us who were fully vaccinated earlier on, you may have gotten booster one, two, and three, but remember the immunity wanes, it doesn't last, right? Even with the natural disease, your body's immune system to this virus decreases over time. So remember Johnson and Johnson was down to like two months and then Moderna and Pfizer was like maybe four to five months. And then it starts to decrease, um, the protection starts to decrease. So why another vaccine? Well, it's to help restore protection that has waned since your previous initial vaccination and the boosters, right? 
What they're trying to do is to provide broader protection against the newer variants. The major goal of vaccines, now remember, the vaccines are not here to prevent you getting uh, COVID-19. What they're really here to do is decrease moderate to severe infection that leads to hospitalization, ICU um, admission, and death, right? So it's not going to stop you from getting COVID, right? Um, the FDA does not consider this a booster. Um, they consider it an, they consider it an updated vaccine. And this particular vaccine now is trying to target um, the XBB 1.5 strain. Now I gave you all these strains with different letters and numbers, but these are all variants of Omicron. And this new vaccine believes that protection against the XBB 1.5, even though it's not the dominant strain right now, but it's close enough to these dominant strains that it's going to provide adequate prevention of moderate to severe disease. So who gets vaccinated? Well, according to the CDC and the Food and Drug Administration, they're recommending one dose of the updated vaccine for everyone six months and older in the United States. That is granted that you got, you know, um, six those earlier doses. Now, most people, if you've never had a COVID-19, the original vaccines or the boosters, all you would need to do, because remember, this vaccine is now against the, the strain that they believe is causing infections, right? Or is closely related. You could get a single dose of this new vaccine if you've never had a COVID vaccine. And that's why I'm saying, if you think about it, it's, it's mimicking the flu shot, right? Younger children might need additional doses depending on their history of COVID-19 infections and vaccinations and pregnant women. So there's, there's enough research out there now that shows that pregnant women provide up to 75% protective antibodies for their um for their infants if they've been vaccinated and that protection can go as far out as 5 months and this and this is really not unique to the covid-19 vaccine a lot of those vaccines that we give pregnant women you know it's such that the babies are covered by those antibodies after birth for up to four to five months. This is a discussion to have with your OBGYN, but just know that it's recommended for pregnant women. Now, this is the interesting part. Who pays? The whole dismantling COVID-19 as a public health emergency, this is what it impacts the most, cost. Right. So the out, so Pfizer and Moderna are charging doctors. This is to purchase, to purchase, y'all ready this? One dose of, of Moderna vaccine can cost, one dose can cost a medical provider anywhere from $110 to $130 per dose. Right. So when I when I put that out of pocket cost, I should have put in there for providers. So think about it. If your doctor or your pharmacist has to stock this covid vaccine and they get a, it comes in boxes. Um, let me see if I can go back real quick and show you. It usually comes in a box of 10. So we can quickly do the math, right? So yeah, so you see, this is how it comes and it says 10 multiple doses. So they have to pay. It's not that the box costs $110. It's that each of these vials in the box costs $110. So this 10 vial box costs 
the pharmacist or the provider over a thousand dollars from from eleven hundred to thirteen hundred dollars, right? Now, with COVID nineteen no longer being a public health emergency, somebody has to absorb that cost. So the first person that's going to, the first people that are going to absorb that cause is if you have insurance, they're going to build your, bill your insurance, the cost of you to get your shot. Right. And depending on the insurance, the bill can, you know, if the, if the one vial is 110 and having been a pediatrician and our bread and butter was vaccine, if I'm paying $110 for a dose I'm not charging the insurance company $110. It's not like I just want to make my money back. I'm going to charge a little bit above because I'm going to add in having to give the shot, you know, and, and those expense. And then the other little overhead expense with giving vaccines. So I might bill the provider $150 for that shot. Now it's up to them what they want to pay me. Right. So this is something now that has to be covered by insurance, but um, the CDC, so it's covered by private insurance, it's covered by Medicare. The CDC is, is trying to work out a deal where for those people who are uninsured or underinsured, they're trying to work out with local health departments, uh, local um, government owned clinics and certain pharmacies to temporarily provide some free shots, right? Temporarily, that's the key word. There is what is known as the bridge access program. And this um, is a program that initially came down uh, through the CDC, and it offers updated COVID-19 vaccines to people who do not have health insurance or those whose health insurance won't cover the shot. That's the other thing. Your health insurance does not have to cover this shot, right? So don't get mad when you say, wait a minute, because that's that's how our medical system works, right? They don't have to cover it. It's not mandatory for them to cover your shot. So I think what all of you would do, those of you who are insured, quickly reach out before you go to the pharmacy, quickly reach out and say, hey, are you covering this new COVID vaccine? That's 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 on the market, right? Um, sometimes you'll have pharmacies that participate in that bridge access program. So if you're uninsured or underinsured, just make the phone call and say, hey, I'm uninsured, but I want to come, you know, I want to come get my COVID-19 vaccine. Do you guys have any discounts? Uh, are you part of the bridge access program? You know, ask, right? Just ask. And I know we're going to do, I'm going to be wrapping up soon because I know we're doing Q and A. Um, all righty. So I think, I believe, no, 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 no. I'm just waiting for my, my computer to catch up with me. Um, I have one last slide, but I'm not sure. Okay, I'm going to escape out of this. I may have to stop sharing because it looks like I'm a little frozen. But I do want to show you this last slide. So let me go back in and then we'll wrap up. I'm going to talk a little bit about churches going forward in this season. And then we can get our questions. This is the last slide I wanted to show. Um, let me see if I could get it big for you. Okay. I took this um, slide straight from the packaging on the new vaccine, um, you know, because it's on there and, um, they have what's called contraindications, warnings, precautions, and then adverse reaction. So a contraindica contraindication, what does that mean? Anything that sh prevents you from taking this vaccine. The only contraindication for this new vaccine is if you have had a severe allergic reaction 
anaphylaxis, where you're short of breath, you, your body swell up your face, to any component of a Pfizer vaccine of a previous dose, right? So right now, that's the only, so if you had a significant severe allergic reaction, and I'm not talking, oh my God, I got a little swelling around the site. You know, I'm talking about severe allergic reaction. That is a contraindication for getting the vaccine. And then what your doctor would probably do, especially if you have some underlying conditions and this would be protective for you, may send you over to an allergist, right? To see if they can desensitize you to the component of the vaccine that um, you're allergic to. Warnings and precaution. Now, y'all, you remember Pfizer um, with the regular, you know, once we started giving the young people the vaccine, it was determined that males between the ages of 12 to 17 were at an increased risk of developing myocarditis, which is swelling of the heart, and pericarditis, which is swelling of the lining around the heart. Right. And we noted that if it happened within that very first week of getting vaccination. So that's a warning. That's a precaution out there. You know, when your doctor is if you're in that age range, you know, it's known it's been proven. Right. And that is a warning and precaution. Once you have that information. Right. Um, then you make the decision you know, do I want to give my, you know, do I want to give my teenager, whatever, male, female within this age group, the vaccine, the, the vaccine, but it is a known risk factor, right? The last, and I'm going to get it because I don't want to give you um, inaccurate information. Um, so I'm pulling it up right now. I believe it like, it was like one in 1.7 million or something like that. Um, but I'll get I'll get that real number for you. Um, um, the other thing that's on here is an adverse reaction. Um, it is um, an adverse reaction, and this is all data that has. Oh, so the the number for. Um, the occurrence of that myocarditis or pericarditis in males between 12 to 17 is um, is twenty two per two point four million vaccinated males in that group, okay? Um, let me, yeah, I'm pulling this up from the packaging right now. The adverse reactions that are, can occur, and um, these are common, is, you know, injection site, swelling, tenderness, redness. Um, you may have a low-grade fever. Uh, for young children, they may be a little irritable. Um, they tend to get low-grade fevers because, you know, their their body is mounting this response. Um, you can have chills. Um, some people get um, like aches and pains. Um, and, and, and that is that is a reflection that your body is mounting a response to this, uh, you know, to this virus, uh, to the to the vaccine. Right. The only time it becomes adverse is if any of those reactions begin to impact breathing walking daily functioning then it it then you put that adverse in front of it um for so we are in the season we're going into the season of the um what we call the triple demic here the fall season you have uh you know SARS covid 2 coronavirus that causes covid you have the flu virus and you have RSV right? I know many of our churches, many of our events, and I can really only speak to the AME church, that the precautions of masking and distancing have become optional, right? Even in the light of the, 
the International Commission, as well as all of the webinars that have been done here through um, PA Avenue AME, AME Ave, we've never really let up on our guidelines as a commission, right? Because, and the reason behind that is because when you look at our church population, we're high risk, we're high risk, period. We're high risk for age, we're high risk for underlying conditions. So we never let up, but I know individual houses of worship, uh, masking became optional, distancing became optional. But here is what I say. We are going into, and you see that uptick. Um, in this, in this, in this season, we can't really afford to be op mask optional, right? And we should maintain at the minimum, it should be six, but you know, we've said, okay, three feet for same households in sanctuary. And many of our sanctuaries, we we still have the ability to to so to to physically distance at least three feet for same households, right? So you know, I know somebody's gonna say, but if my pastor says, but we all make our own informed decisions, right? Um, you know, I in my local church, I think for I think it was late, it was. Initially, yeah, I went mask optional and I already told my congregation that we're going back to mask requiring, right? Um, the physical distances always still stayed the same because, you know, we have enough space to still physically distance. Um, I still do the questionnaire, but my insurance company still requires the questionnaire. But last winter, I picked up with the questionnaire, um, we were able to pick up some some people that were recently infected, not just with COVID, but the flu, and were not able to join for worship, right? So I know that even though the International Health Commission has never let up on our guidelines about wearing masks for worship or large gatherings, that it became optional. I don't believe we can stay optional for this upcoming season because as you see, uh, COVID-19 virus, it's already in an uptick since the end of July and it's only going to go higher, right? Because it's a cold virus. It likes the cold, right? Flu likes the cold. RSV likes the cold. And RSV now back in my day was really a childhood infection, but our seniors are getting impacted by RSV. I just had a congregant who got diagnosed with RSV. And as you can see on that slide with symptoms, it's hard to tell them apart, right? So you may have what you say is cold symptoms, but you, sh you, know, um, you know, if you're going for a test, your doctor should be checking you for the flu, should be checking you for COVID-19 and now over the counter, you can buy those um, dual viral tests where they'll check you for one, two, or three. Um, not every insurance company pays for it, but um, we need to mask. We need to physically distance. And the other thing is that we, I think some of us straight away from was that 20 second hand wash. That stays the same no matter what. It's just hygienic, right? <laughs> to to take 20 seconds to wash your hand, right? That should never be something that, you know, becomes optional, right? Take 20 seconds, wash your hands, right? We need to defog our sanctuaries. And I'm not talking about the big defog. We, you need to be defogging your sanctuaries. That I never stopped defogging my sanctuary after we assembled, Right. You got to do that. So we got to be vigilant. We're in the season of the big three, COVID, flu, and RSV. Um, and that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. And we can, um, I don't know who's been monitoring the chat for questions, but we can open up for questions. Well, Dr. Lisa, I've been monitoring the chat. What has been happening was everyone was being asked to put their name, their church, their city, Mm -hmm. um you know the information in the chat but now the chat is open mm -hmm. um as well 
Um, and let me say to uh, Sister uh, Benny, thank you for helping. And Reverend L Linda, thank you also for helping. I just got an email from Reverend Kavnis. You gave me a little update and I said, okay. Um, and so if you guys, y'all all know what's going on. 